um, since the first PDF file that I sent yesterday or the day before. So you may find some things are not quite the same as in your PDF version. One thing that I've added here is my email address in case you need to contact me. So that's down the bottom there. And the purpose of this lecture in the advanced parasitology class in the past, other lecturers at KKU have talked about the taxonomy of parasites. So I have picked up that topic and will present that today. There will be an emphasis on phylogeny, which is the evolutionary relationships of species, on systematics, and on taxonomy. Taxonomy is the basis for understanding the biology of organisms. So these are the general topics. Both of you have a biological background, so you may be familiar with some of these topics already. Um, we'll see. So the diversity of organisms is generally measured in units that we call species. The identification and classification of called taxonomy. This is a field, a research area, which nowadays is very poorly studied and poorly taught, but I will say some more about that later. Species are related to one another through time, and this process, the study of this process, is phylogenetics. An understanding of phylogeny helps us to arrange species into genera and families, etc. A process which is given the name systematics. Now, now, each of us, all of you sitting there in Kanakan, and myself sitting here in Australia, we are each like a time machine. In our DNA sequences, in our genetic data, we have the history of our origins from the earliest ancestors until the present day. For example, we all carry ribosomal RNA genes. We can recognize those same genes in the and yet we have not shared for maybe two billion years and possibly a lot longer. So each of us is like a time machine, carrying genetic data from the ancient past until the present days. Therefore, the evolutionary history of a group of species, that is phylogenetics, can be shown in a tree-like diagram. A tree grows from a root. And I'll show you an example of a tree. Fairly typical phylogenetic tree. You may already be familiar with this. But the tree this is the direct this arrow time ago to this way. And there are various other terminologies that are useful to point out. Clade, clade one, clade two. A clade is a group of species which can all be traced to a single most recent common ancestor. We have the same here with clade one. There is the most recent common ancestor of species A, and species B. 
forming a clade. All members of a clade have come from a single most recent common ancestor. Points in the tree where the tree branches are called nodes. So there is a node there, 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 and there. And sometimes these points at the end of the branches are called terminal nodes. So that's an example of a phylogenetic tree. <clears throat> now I suspect that both of you have seen these before in the past in your study of biology. Genetic trees in many different ways, but they can all be interpreted in a similar way. Here, for example, is a phylogenetic tree of all of life. The root of the tree a long time ago is bacteria-like organisms, which split sometime, we don't know exactly when, possibly three billion years ago, maybe two billion years ago, to give the bacteria. A later branch gave rise to the archaeans, a group of bacteria-like organisms, <coughs> and then Another split gave rise to the eukaryotes, that is organisms which have a nucleus inside a nuclear membrane. And amongst the eukaryotes, one small group is the animals. The animals is actually quite a small group of organisms, really. We always think it's the most important group, but that's only because we are animals. This is the same tree shown in an unrooted format. So sometimes the tree is shown with a root like this, showing you the direction of time. Sometimes it is shown in some other format like this, which does not show the direction of time. So this one is unrooted. And sometimes you can draw the lengths of branches in a tree proportional to the amount of change. So in this tree, this was published by researchers at KKU in 2019, there are sequences, DNA sequences from Strongyloides fuliborni and Strongyloides stercoralis, two common parasites. This phylogenetic tree was drawn to show the difference between them. And it also shows the different branch lengths. So there is a scale bar here. It's not very easy to see it, but 0 0.02 means that on a branch of that length, 2% of the DNA bases have changed. So roughly from here to here, from this node to Strongyloides myrtsi, I think that is, the DNA sequences have changed 2%. So trees come in many different formats. This is another one which I like because the group of parasites that I know best are the trematodes. There are maybe 25,000 species of trematodes, but we don't know for sure. <coughs> there are certainly over 100 families. And this phylogenetic tree quite complicated, is based on phylogenetic analysis <coughs> of nuclear ribosomal RNA genes. And here is another phylogenetic tree. This is another way in which the tree can be drawn. This is called a network. So it looks quite a lot different from the previous trees, but really it's the same kind of thing. This phylogenetic tree or this network, I will show again on a much later slide. But for the moment, I will explain it briefly. It was published only a few months ago in a paper by Ajahn Paibun and Bamboo. Some of you will know the student Bamboo, who I'm not sure where she is at the moment. She was in Singapore. And these are genetic clusters of the liver fluke Opistorchis viverini, identified 
using, in this case, mitochondrial DNA sequences. You can see this circle here. This represents a particular haplotype in the mitochondrial genome. Amongst all the sequences that we got, 11 of those sequences were of this haplotype, hence the circle. The red color gives the locality from which that came. The colors are a little bit distorted on this slide, but most of those 11 haplotypes came from Sakhon Nakhon province, one locality, which I'll call Nonghan. One haplotype came from the same place, but in 2018. These other ones came earlier, I think 2011. So this cluster, this 11 haplotypes, all the same sequence, differ from this one haplotype here by a single base change represented by that mark on the line. So these three haplotypes shown here form a distinct cluster with an opistorchis, which are distinct from all the other opistorchis sequences. And the number of marks along this line shows the number of differences between here and here. So this kind of diagram, this kind of network diagram is a kind of phylogeny that can show a lot more information. And I like phylogenetic trees. Other people seem to like phylogenetic trees as well. So they have made tattoos, which are, some of them are crazy. Would you put a tattoo like that on the top of your head? What? Some people are mad. Or here, there's another tattoo. I don't know who would see that. So these are some more trees that people have put on their bodies. Usually what we show at the tips of the tree branches are species. So the question we have to ask, what is a species? Now, I had intended <coughs> to stop talking at this point and to ask Tao and Black to tell me what a species is. But I think the sound quality is a little bit difficult. So maybe I will keep talking and maybe next week or maybe at the end of the lecture, we can come back to look at that question again. But I will answer it here. So the traditional concept of a species is quite simple. We can call it the morphological species concept. And simply, if two organisms resemble each other more than they resemble any other organism, then they probably belong to the same species. So you and I resemble one another, despite the difference in hair color, you and I resemble one another more than we resemble a chimpanzee. So we might say from the morphological species concept that we must belong to the same species and that we're different from a chimpanzee. It follows logically from that, that if two organisms look different, then they belong to different species. The trouble with the morphological species concept is that it can be very misleading. Here is an example of that. Here are two different butterflies. They look extremely similar. In fact, it's quite hard to see what the differences are when you take a quick look. But these are completely unrelated butterflies. They live in different places. Sorry, they live in the same area, but they are very different and unrelated. 
So this is an example where the morphological species concept may mislead us. We would look at this and this and say, these two belong to the same species. But when we investigate more carefully, we discover they are completely different. I can try to find some examples from parasites, although it's not always so easy. On the right here is the front end of a trematode worm. This trematode lives in crocodiles. So you should not be familiar with it, but most trematodes have an oral sucker and a ventral sucker and the oral sucker opens into a mouth, which runs through a pharynx and then into a forked intestine like this. So people will look at these and they'll say, yes, this structure is an oral sucker. This structure is a pharynx. Well, here is another trematode. The ventral sucker is not shown. But we have a structure here that looks like an oral sucker. We have a structure here that looks like a pharynx. So scientists who have worked on these eventually realized <coughs> that this structure is not an oral sucker. This structure is a pharynx. And this structure is not a pharynx. It is a new structure only found in this kind of trematode. So when we look at the morphology, we can easily be misled just on the morphology. So the morphological species concept is okay, but it has limitations something more than appearance is needed, which leads us to the most commonly used species concept, which is the biological species concept. And this states quite simply that if individuals can breed with one another and produce viable fertile offspring, then they must belong to the same species. And it follows from that, that individuals of one species should not be able to produce viable fertile offspring with members of any other species. So the biological species concept then emphasizes that a species is a group of organisms that can interbreed successfully and produce viable offspring. That is the biological species concept. Quite simple and straightforward most of the time, but not always very easy to apply <clears throat> because if we want to apply the biological species concept, <clears throat> we need to look for evidence that the study organisms are or are not capable of interbreeding. So if you have some dinosaur skeletons, how can you tell whether those are capable of interbreeding? If you're trying to work with fossils like dinosaurs, well, you cannot. There is no way you can determine whether dinosaurs could interbreed. So you can't apply the biological species concept to dinosaurs. Most of the time, people will use two approaches, two methods. One method is experimental matings of individuals to see whether they can produce viable offspring. Okay, you can do that with fruit flies in the laboratory. You can do it with cows. 
You can do it with a lot of different things, but it's extremely difficult to do this experimentally with parasites. Some parasites, maybe. Most parasites, you would find it very difficult to try crossbreeding to see if they are interfertile. And for things like whales, how would you do an experimental cross on a blue whale and a minky whale? It's impossible. So you have to find another approach. <clears throat> and the other approach which is often used is an indirect approach using genetic methods. You can take small tissue samples from whales and analyze those, do genetic analysis on them, and those will tell you whether samples from different whales indicate that they are capable of interbreeding. You can also do that with parasites. Now, what's happened? My My keyboard has stopped. Just a moment. My keyboard has stopped responding, I think. Here we are. So an example of the use of genetic methods comes from the lung flukes, genus Paragonimus. <clears throat> I think you should be familiar with this group of trematodes. Paragonimus heterotremus is a human parasite in Thailand, but I want to talk about some other Paragonimus species. The taxonomy of Paragonimus has been difficult because often the adult worms look quite similar, but the metasacarial cysts look very different. Here are examples of metasacarial cysts from what have been called three different species of Paragonimus. Paragonimus ohirai, the metasacarial cyst within a crab has a thick Or we can use the morphological species concept. Okay, do you want to ask a question? All good? Yes, yes, uh, it's very good. Uh, we just have uh, several problems with the internet connection just uh, about one minute ago, but now we are good. Okay. Do you want me to go back to some of the previous slides? Can you go to like our previous one or two slides? Okay. Thank you. Yes, uh, actually you just, uh, I, I think the Paragonimus one, we just like that from that slide. The Oh, from this slide, okay. Uh, you, you, uh, we lost uh, when you talked about the difference between the metasacarial and paragonimus. Okay, okay, I, I, will re I will repeat that. Thank you. So these are metasacarial of paragonimus. Because of the taxonomic difficulties with adult paragonimus, many species are described based on the metasacarial cyst, which you find in a freshwater or brackish water crab, like these, these cysts. You can see how different these three cysts appear. I won't go back through the details of the differences, but people long assumed that these must all belong to different species. 
But by the use of genetic methods, including DNA sequence analysis, it became, became clear that all three of these actually belong to a single biological species. So if we apply the biological species concept to Paragonimus, all of these belong to one species. <clears throat> a little bit later, I'll explain what the name of that species should be. So the next topic, how do new species come into being? How do new species form? What happens? Well, this is the process known as speciation. Now, I suspect that the two students, Tao and Black, will know something about this, but I'm not sure, so I will go through. Quite often the students in this class do not have a background in biology, rather they have a background in medical technology and similar subjects. But biologists should know something about this topic. I'm going to make it very simple because and sympatric speciation. Allopatric means that the species diverge in different places. Allo meaning other and patric referring to place or country. Sym sympatric means that the speciation occurs in one place, in the same place. Sym meaning together and patric meaning Again, place or nation or country. The typical model of allopatric speciation, it's very simple and you should be familiar with it. We can imagine that we have a species. And this black line represents the geographical range of a species. And these represent, these small circles here, represent perhaps individual representatives or individual small populations of that species. Now imagine that some kind of barrier appears within the range. That barrier might be a mountain range, perhaps the sea level rises and separates this range into two islands. It could be anything, anything that causes a break. So now the individuals on this side of the barrier cannot reach individuals on this side to interbreed. So on each side of the barrier, the individuals can only interbreed with each other. So we have now two isolated populations. Through the processes of natural selection and genetic drift, through the processes of natural selection and genetic drift, these populations either side of the barrier may move apart genetically. This process is probably quite slow and it may take a million years, it may take less, but it can take a long time. The problem is with my computer.
but I don't understand why. Excuse me for a moment. PowerPoint. Okay, I don't know what the problem is. I will drop that. Okay, can you hear me now? <clears throat> Just put your hand up if you can hear me. Okay. I have no idea what the problem is, but my computer seemed to be seemed to have frozen. <coughs> So if we imagine that a barrier appears and after a long time, individuals on one side of the barrier can no longer interbreed with individuals on another. If we remove the barrier, we now have two species. Speciation has occurred, process of speciation, and we have two daughter species. That is the allopatric speciation model. It's the standard model which everybody is taught in school and everywhere else, but it has a number of problems and limitations. One of these concerns time. Sometimes there has not been enough time for complete genetic isolation to occur. So when two species come into contact after a period of separation, they can exchange genes and produce hybrids. Now, there are many kinds of hybrids in nature, and some of these hybrids are parasites, which can, in fact, be quite dangerous. One example of hybrids is in Fasciola, Fasciola hepatica, the common liver fluke, and Fasciola gigantica, the large liver fluke. Fasciola gigantica occurs in Thailand. It's very large. It's usually in cattle, sheep, and so on, but occasionally it infects humans. Similarly, Fasciola hepatica tends to be in cool climates and will occasionally infect humans, but usually it's in cattle and sheep. In many parts of Asia now, there are hybrids between these two species. These hybrids are very often triploid. <coughs> triploid means that they have, instead of two sets of chromosomes as we do, they have three sets. They are not able to produce normal eggs or normal sperm. Instead, they produce eggs by parthenogenesis. So the hybrid is able to produce clones of itself and it can breed into large numbers within a locality. So these hybrids can be quite dangerous. The fasciola hybrids are commonly known right through tropical Asia and in many other places. Other hybrids have been found in Schistosoma, the blood flukes of humans and mammals, and also in Paragonimus, the lung flukes. So sometimes species have not been separate for long enough to have become absolutely completely new species. They can still hybridize if they meet one another. And that can be a problem for things like in the case of fasciola. 
<coughs> Something else that can occur is sympatric speciation. When a new species can arise within the range of the parent species. In other words, if one species splits into two without geographical separation. <coughs> you may wonder how that could possibly happen. Well, in the case of parasites, it seems to happen through host switching. Uh, let's just have a look at the pointer. Seems to happen through host switching. If the parasites switch into a different host species, then they can no longer mate with individuals in the original host species. This is a point which I will dwell on a little bit. So simply by moving into a different host species, the parasites in the new host species cannot meet and mate with the parasites in the original host species. So now they cannot interbreed. Already they are effectively separate species. Similar, closely related, but now in different hosts. <coughs> An extreme example of this might be something like Cardicola. This is a genus of blood flukes, trematodes. Almost all of these species occur in the hearts of fish in the ocean. We found this one in the heart of a marine mammal, the dugong, and there I hope is the Thai name for this. So all other species of Cardicola live in fish, but somehow, sometime in the past, this one switched into a mammal. The adult worms only breed now in the mammal, in the dugong. So now we have a new species of Cardicola, which has arisen by host switching. Another example is this one. Humans arrived in South America. Well, it's a little unclear, maybe between 12,000 and 20,000 years ago. Monkeys in South America have a head louse species, which looks very similar to the human head louse. And it seems pretty clear now that the monkey head louse in South America has come from humans as a result of a host switch after humans arrived in South America. The monkey head louse is now regarded as a distinct species different from the human one. But it arose as a host switch from humans sometime in the past. And there are many other examples of that. I won't go into much detail, but it's been post switching has been implicated in trichinella, which you should be familiar with, and also in some parasites of fish. There are 25,000 species of fish in the world. This genus of parasites that lives on the gills of fish has been host switching for many millions of years. And it now looks as though there is a different species of this parasite on every species of fish, maybe 20,000 different species of these. So very many. And yet another example of host switching comes from the blood flukes of mammals. The schistosomes, genus Schistosoma. The earliest members of Schistosoma evolved millions of years ago, possibly 20 million years ago, possibly even earlier than that. <clears throat> they evolved long before humans existed. And this is a phylogenetic trees of the schistosomes, showing an early split, maybe in the Miocene era, between schistosomes in Asia and schistosomes in Africa. Schistosomes seem to have moved backwards and forwards between Asia and Africa through time. Humans only arrived recently 
maybe in the last 1 million years for Homo erectus, or the last 60,000 years for modern humans outside Africa. But schistosomes have post-switched into modern humans. So I was saying that um, an ancestral species exists for some time. At some point, it splits into two separate new species. So species A, which was here, no longer exists. It's been replaced by two daughter species. These two are sister species, B and C. More time goes. Species B has split again to give rise to species D and species E. This one has split to give rise to species F and species G. But species G has become extinct, so it no longer exists. And you can see that time is continuing. And perhaps this is the situation today. We now have all of these species, H to M. This species became extinct a long time ago. So species A back here has given rise to all of these different species. Now in a phylogenetic analysis, there's some terminology that you need to be aware of. And we should try when we classify species to incorporate the evolutionary history into that classification. So take a look here species H and species I. These two species have more in common than they do with any other species in the tree. This entire branch here indicates ancestry, if you like, shared only by species H and I. No other species share ancestry with this branch. So we may call these two species a monophyletic group, and perhaps we would put them in the same genus. Similarly, species J and K are sister or sibling species, which have shared a long joint history, which they have not shared with any other species. So perhaps in a classification, we would like to put H and J into a single genus, genus alpha. They had a most recent common in species J and K. Their most recent common ancestor. are nested within genera, and genera, as in alpha and beta here, are nested within families. This classification system, which is what we use today, is the Linnaean system. And I'll say a little more about that later. But for the moment, I'll come back here. So the branching pattern of a phylogenetic tree represents the taxonomic hierarchy, or should do, if we have not made any mistakes. A classification built in this way will accurately reflect the course of evolution and allow us to make predictions about the biological properties of newly discovered organisms. I'll say more about that a bit later. Genus alpha is monophyletic. Genus beta is also monophyletic. Family gamma is also monophyletic. Let's take a look at that definition. A group of organisms is monophyletic if all, it's, if all of the members of the group have descended from a single 
the most recent common ancestor, and if the group contains all descendants from that common ancestor. Okay, genus Alpha, its most recent common ancestor is here. Species H and species I have descended from that most recent common ancestor. Genus Alpha contains only species which have descended from that most recent common ancestor. So genus Alpha is monophyletic. The same argument applies to genus Beta. Species J and K descended from this most recent common ancestor. Family Gamma, all of the species within it have descended from this most recent common ancestor, further back in the tree. All of these are monophyletic. The trouble with constructing a phylogenetic tree or a taxonomic system is that we very often make mistakes. And we make mistakes <coughs> usually because we misinterpret the morphology of the organisms. We look at the structures and we think, oh, these two are not related, or oh, these two are closely related. But we make mistakes, and this happens very frequently. Much of the argument that occurs between taxonomists has been about how to interpret morphology. So we may, by mistake, place species or genera or families into paraphyletic groups. A paraphyletic group is one in which all the members have descended from a most recent common ancestor. So here we have a paraphyletic group, H, I, and J. They have all descended from this most recent common ancestor. But, but, not all the descendants of that ancestor are included in the group. Species K has been omitted by mistake. So we may propose that all of these are one family and that K belongs to another family. That would be a mistake because we have misinterpreted the structure of species K when we have compared it with these ones. Such a grouping is called paraphyletic. And this is very common in classification systems. Now, the vertebrates, you all know what vertebrates are. The vertebrates includes, or the higher vertebrates, includes mammals, birds, reptiles, amphibians, those four groups, mammals, birds, reptiles, amphibians. One of those groups, one of those four groups is paraphyletic. Can anyone tell me which one it is? Does anyone want to give a suggestion? Okay, I'll go. Okay, yes, please. Yeah, yeah. You can continue with the next slide. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, um, a paraphyletic group in the higher vertebrates is reptiles. The reason why reptiles are paraphyletic is because another group of vertebrates, of birds, should be classified within the reptiles, but we normally put them as a separate group. Birds are reptiles. They should not be separate. So reptiles is like this group here. Crocodiles, turtles, lizards, snakes. But it should also include the birds. Because birds come from the same most recent common ancestor as all the reptiles. And to be more specific, birds are living dinosaurs. Birds are not a separate group. Birds are descendants of one subgroup of dinosaurs. We may also make other mistakes and classify things in polyphyletic groupings and so on. 
Ideally, the Linnaean system should group organisms in a strictly monophyletic classification, but we often make mistakes and we don't know enough to do that properly. Methods are improving, especially molecular methods. So each category, if we have proper monophyletic groups, each category in a hierarchical classification of nested monophyletic groups will have the general properties of the level above it. So frogs, crocodiles, platypus, kangaroo, elephant, all have the properties of four legs. Or in the case of snakes, you can show that snake ancestors used to have four legs snakes no longer do. So four legs is a property of all of these groups, amphibians, reptiles, platypus, kangaroo, placental mammals. If we find a new species of mammal, we will know that it should have four legs or that its ancestors did. The reptiles and all the mammals have what's called an amniotic egg, particular kind of egg structure. The word amniotic refers to the membranes that develop around an, a developing embryo. So if we find a new species of reptile or of mammal, we know that that should have an amniotic egg. If it's a mammal we're talking about, we know that all mammals have hair. So if we find a new mammal, yes, it will have hair. And it should have, if it is a marsupial, or a placental mammal, it will have good mammary glands and give birth to live young. One small group of mammals do not give birth to live young, they still lay eggs, and that is the platypus and echidna, both found here where I live, and so on. So if we find a new species of placental mammal, we will know that it should have a placenta, give birth to live young, have mammary glands and hair, four legs and an amniotic egg, even before we look at anything else. So this is like an information retrieval system. This is like a classification of library books. <coughs> a good classification system tells us a lot about a group of organisms. And I think we can ignore the first two points on this slide, I'll just make the point taxonomy is the process of naming species and placing them within a classification. That's what taxonomists do. Taxonomy is the basis for communication and comparison in all other kinds of studies on living organisms. <clears throat> if you have a think about that, you'll see it's true. Almost every paper you read about parasites will give the Latin name of a parasite, will give its taxonomic name. In other words, recognizing that taxonomy is the basis for communication in studies on living organisms. We need to have a name. We use a name for that organism. The classification system we use today was devised by Linnaeus in the 18th century. Hence, we call it the Linnaean system. Linnaeus was an interesting character. I don't have time to tell you more about him, but he was a Swedish nobleman. So he was a well-off gentleman of leisure whose interest was natural history. He was the one who proposed this nested system nested because species A and species B might be nested in genus alpha. Species C and species D might be nested within genus beta. And genus alpha and beta in turn are nested within family, well, family gamma, family whatever. <coughs> when, Laius, when Linnaeus was doing this work, he only classified all the known species of animals and plants that he recognized was very few species by modern standards, about 4,400 species of animals. In 1758, 
he published the 10th edition of his classification of animals. And he gave every species a name consisting of two words, the species name and the name of the genus. So the 10th edition of his Systema Naturae, dated 1758, is the starting point of the classification system that everybody uses today. And that includes parasitologists. Here is the information he has about intestinal worms. He recognized the genus Ascaris, and he put in the genus Ascaris vermicularis. Well, we know that today as the pinworm, and we have moved it to a different genus, Enterobius. He also recognized Ascaris lumbricoides, the giant roundworm of humans and pigs. We still keep that name. He included in there various other things as well. You'll see that his definition of the genus Ascaris was extremely brief. That is Linnaeus's own definition. Modern definitions and modern classifications tend to have a large number of steps in them. This is the classification of Opistorchis viverini. This one was not known by Linnaeus. It was only described, I think, in 1895. Opistorchis viverini put in a family, an order, subclass Digenia, class Trematoda, phylum Platyhelminthes, kingdom Metazoa, super kingdom Eukaryota. So nowadays, classification systems are complex, but they are nested and they have many steps to them. Species nested within genus, nested within family, nested within order, subclass, class, phylum, and so on. Well, if taxonomy is the basis for communication in all of biological sciences, including parasitology, what does a taxonomist do? Well, taxonomists are usually expert only in a particular group of organisms, and it can take many years to become an expert in that group. Taxonomists constantly review the classification of their special group, especially taking into account new species that have been described and perhaps re-describing old species if they have new specimens, additional specimens of those old species. Taxonomists describe new species. For anyone who has not tried it, this is not a simple task. The taxonomist needs to review and consider all species that might be related that have ever been described. <clears throat> and that may include species descriptions in English and in Chinese and in Russian and in Georgian and Japanese and Azerbaijani. So you may need to look at species descriptions in many different languages and try to understand what they are all saying. In the past, species descriptions were based only on morphology. Now, descriptions of new species will typically include morphology and molecular work, usually DNA sequences. <clears throat> Taxonomists will need to place their new species within an existing systematic framework of genera and families, or they may need to change that framework to accommodate the new species. They're always trying to change the framework of genera, families, and so on, to recognize monophyletic groups. And they may even need to change the names of species So as I've already mentioned, the scientific name of a species is always two words together. This, ent this is Enterobius vermicularis. So remember that Linnaeus described Ascaris vermicularis. 
And here is his description of Ascaris mellifollicularis, which he also says was described by somebody else in the year 1269, I think, I'm not entirely sure. <coughs> but his description of the common pinworm says, habitat, it lives in swamps, and it lives in the roots of rotting plants and in the intestines of children and horses. So his concept of Enterobius funicularis is not quite the same as ours. In 1853, somebody called Leach said, look, this cannot be left in the genus Ascaris. We have to find a new genus for it. We have to take Vermicularis and put it in a new genus, which Leach called Enterobius Vermicularis, Enterobius. So the name now is Enterobius Vermicularis in brackets, Linnaeus 1758, which indicates that Linnaeus placed it in a different genus. Then Leach 1853, to indicate that it's now in the genus Enterobius. <clears throat> a similar example of this kind of thing takes me back to what I said earlier about Paragonimus. You remember the earlier slide showing the different metasacarial cysts of Paragonimus species. <clears throat> People have generally identified different species on the basis of their metasacarial cyst structure. In 1939, Miyazaki in Japan described Paragonimus uhirai. This is part of his original description, written in traditional Japanese, where the letters run on the right-hand side of the page from top to bottom, and then move across towards the left in vertical columns. So if you go back to look at the original description of Paragonimus ohirai, you are confronted with this Japanese description. In China, somebody called Chen, Chen Xingtao, described Paragonimus iloxuenensis. It had a very different type of metasacaria. And then later, Miyazaki described Paragonimus saduensis, again from Japan, again with a different kind of metasacaria. These are the three kinds of metasacarial cysts that I showed you in that earlier slide. Some of the early genetic studies, alazyme studies, suggested there was little difference between the three species. This was studies done in the 1970s and 80s. If you don't know what alazymes are, I don't have time to explain them now, but I could in a future lecture. Some Japanese researchers did some experiments, very difficult experiments, doing experimental crossbreeding of these three kinds, Ohirai, Eloxuenensis, and Saduensis. These cross experiments indicated that all three belong to the same species and that the differences in the metasacarial cysts, the different morphologies were due to a simple Mendelian polymorphism and did not indicate that these species belong to a different, that all three belong to different species. <clears throat> then DNA sequence analysis, which is something that I did about 15 years ago, they also indicate that all three belong to the same species. So if we accept that, <clears throat> then we accept that Paragonimus eloxoenensis and Paragonimus sadoensis are not valid species. We call them junior synonyms of Paragonimus ohirai. So Paragonimus ohirai was the first one to be described. So we say this was the oldest one, these other ones are junior names. They are younger names. Synonym means different name for the same species. So these are junior synonyms, Paragonimus ohirai. So this is a simple example of names being changed or suppressed 
according to the rules of nomenclature. Protocols for handling these kinds of problems are in the International Code for Zoological Nomenclature, which is now available free online. So you can look it up anytime you like, and it gives a set of rules that we should use when we are naming new species or changing the names of old species. This set of rules is very necessary, largely because of the huge number of species that actually exist and to provide a protocol for repairing errors or to change opinions that have been made in the past. Scientific knowledge increases always through time. Through time, we always find that some of our opinions from the past are incorrect and we need to modify them. In terms of taxonomy, we need a set of guidelines or rules to help us to do that in a consistent way. This helps provide stability at nomenclature. We don't want names to keep changing unnecessarily. We want stability. So the rules help provide that. The rules also insist that there should be type specimens for any new species. So if you name a species, you can't just say, here's a species, I've named it, thank you, goodbye. You can't do that. You must say, here are the specimens. These specimens are named as type specimens. These type specimens are the ones on which the name of the species must rest. And usually the type specimens must be in some kind of national museum collection. There are some big international collections of type specimens of parasites around the world. The biggest ones are in London and in Washington, DC. These contain tens of thousands of parasite specimens, including many of the original type specimens on which new species have been described. <clears throat> A side issue, which I don't want to talk about too much, is that it's becoming increasingly difficult to find taxonomists. In many groups, there are no taxonomists left. Governments and research institutions say that taxonomy is boring, taxonomy is old fashioned, taxonomy is not necessary. And you will find the same attitude, I think, in CONCAN, which is unfortunate because as we find more information out about organisms, including parasites, we need more taxonomic clarity. I've done work in China on the life cycles and on the taxonomy of lung flukes. Lung flukes go through freshwater snails and freshwater crabs. Therefore, there should be some interest in the taxonomy of freshwater snails and freshwater crabs in China. To the best of my knowledge, there are no taxonomists left in China <coughs> who work on freshwater crabs and only a few who work on freshwater snails. So there is no taxonomic expertise, and this is a situation which is getting worse around the world. <clears throat> it's also getting worse because we now know that many species are disappearing. We have a biodiversity crisis. Species are disappearing before they are even named or known. <clears throat> and increasingly with new techniques to help us identify and to distinguish between species, we are lacking the taxonomists who can put these in a logical framework. A DNA sequence by itself is not the same as a new species. It's just a DNA sequence. <coughs> we might ask how many species of parasites are there? Well, we don't really know. But one estimate, a recent estimate for digenetic trematodes is 44,000 species. Earlier, I said 25,000 species, which is an old estimate. For monogenetic trematodes, mostly in fish, 
We don't know. Sorry, we don't know. There are maybe 20,000 species in the genus Gyrodactylus alone. Well, that's a lot. Cestodes, the tapeworms, we don't know. The most recent estimate is 23,000 species. Nematodes, just parasitic nematodes, not all nematodes. If we include all nematodes, the figure is probably around 1 million. But if we include only the parasites, we think maybe 28,000 or more. Acanthocephalin, 6,000. Parasitic insects, including parasitic wasps, more than 1 million. Protists, things like malaria, ciliates, amoebae, the flagellates, all the rest of them, we have no idea. Probably uncountable numbers. Nobody knows. This is particularly a problem because molecular studies are increasingly finding greater diversity than we previously knew about. And it may be true that most parasite species are still undescribed. A recent estimate says there may be 350,000 species of helminths found in vertebrates. Almost all of these are still unnamed. So that brings me to the last topic, molecular studies. Usually the molecular studies that we bring to identification of parasites or any other species are DNA sequences. There are other kinds of methods we can use, but this is the most typical. They can help us, but they can also add to confusion. We need to learn how to interpret molecular data. The interpretation is usually done in the form of a phylogenetic tree or a network. And we need to match molecular data and the conclusions that we might reach from it to the rules of naming species. The rules that I mentioned, the code of nomenclature, is actually being modified to try to bring molecular data into consideration as well. Molecular studies, DNA sequences in particular, have revealed a far greater diversity of parasites than we previously suspected. This is just one of many examples, an example of what we might call molecular prospecting. What this was done, this was published in 2017. <clears throat> A group of people collected parenthistomes. Those are trematodes that live mainly in cattle and other ruminant mammals, but some also occur in humans in various parts of the world. These parenthistomes were collected from cattle Sicarii of these paramphistomes were also collected from various snails. So Bulinus is a snail. So they collected Sicaria from snails. They collected adults from cattle and sheep and goats. And they collected and they sequenced 28 sRNA genes. And they produced this phylogenetic tree. So they were able to say, for example, that this clade here from goats and cattle, and also from this snail, Bulinus fuscalii, belong to the species Calicophora microbothrium. They were able to say the same for this, but for all these others, they were uncertain about the identification. They couldn't be exactly sure because they couldn't find decent reference sequences. And in some cases, they had no idea at all what the species is. So for example, here, these were Sicarii that came from three snails of the genus Segmentorbis collected in Africa. These formed a very distinct clade in the tree must be some kind of parenthistone. We don't know what. So the point is, 
that molecular methods have revealed a far greater diversity of parasites than we knew existed in the past. And we need to find ways of working with that. Another example. This is really within notionally a single species. Interpretation of molecular data can be very difficult. All of these sequences here came from Paragonimus westermani. Paragonimus westermani occurs in Thailand, but there are no known human cases in Thailand. Why is that? I don't know. Human cases come from the Philippines, where they are very common, and from China, Japan, Korea, Taiwan, where they used to be very common, but they are now mostly controlled by public health measures. Another species, Paragonimus siamensis, belongs within this group. Now, morphologically speaking, the adults of all of these kinds cannot be told apart. If we get an adult worm, they all look the same. The metasacchariae of many of these kinds, however, differ from one another, <coughs> and the DNA sequences also differ from one another. The only adult which is morphologically distinct is Paragonimus siamensis. All the remaining ones are Paragonimus westermani, and we cannot distinguish between them by morphology. So we have a lot of molecular diversity within what appears to be Paragonimus westermani. We have a lot of variation in the structure of the metasacarial cysts within what appears to be Paragonimus westermani. We have, in fact, in the very same place in Northeast India, we have more than one kind of Paragonimus westermani. There's one there and another one here coming in different places in this tree. And in Thailand, we have more than one kind, one coming here and one coming here in the phylogenetic tree. What is going on? Now we could discuss this for a long time, but it may well turn out that some of these should be regarded as cryptic, there's the word there, hidden species. Species, species which cannot be recognized by morphology. But when we start analyzing molecular data, in addition to morphology, we say, oh, these are distinct. We should call them a different name. So this kind of situation keeps occurring when we start introducing molecular analysis to the study of parasites. This means that we need to find a way to incorporate the uncertainties that molecular data introduce and, and join them with the morphological data to make some kind of decision, some kind of sense. This is not particularly easy and we're still trying to find ways to do it. So there is the question at the bottom of the slide. Is Paragonimus westermani one species or several? Nobody has yet answered that species, and it may come down to a matter of opinion by biologists and parasitologists who work on them, and the opinions may change in the future. So DNA sequence data, molecular data, is not necessarily an automatic way to solve all the problems in the taxonomy of parasites. Oh, and the same thing occurs. <laughs> Welcome back. 
Welcome back. Oh. Today we have a problem. I thought I was. All right. Okay. I can go back here. Maybe wrong place. Actually, I'll close that. Okay, just a moment. Okay, can you hear me? Just put your, can you see the slide? Okay. So use of DNA sequences there, are, DNA sequences may vary within a species. And you saw that possibly with Paragonimus vestimani on the previous slide and can also vary between species. So we need to decide where the limits of a species should be placed. There may be errors in DNA sequences, or sometimes the wrong thing might be sequenced. A colleague of mine in Japan worked very hard to obtain mitochondrial DNA from Ascaris. This was nearly 30 years ago when the methods were not so well developed. Eventually he obtained DNA sequence, but when we checked, it was his own DNA sequence, not Ascaris. DNA sequences don't infect people. Just a moment, I'll get the pointer. DNA sequences don't infect people. Parasites infect people. So we need an actual organism on which to base the study, not a tiny fragment of its genome. And if we find a new species, we need specimens of the parasite as well as DNA. And remember, and this is actually very important, there are many incorrect or incomplete identifications in GenBank. And there are many sequences in GenBank from unnamed parasites. This is from a study by Roderick Page in 2016 and shows the percentage of identified, that is named species versus unnamed species for invertebrates, not just parasites, but all invertebrates. So you can see in 1995, the percentage of named species represented by DNA sequences in GenBank was close to 90%. And a small proportion was of unnamed invertebrate species. Now, most of the DNA sequences from invertebrates in GenBank are not from named species. They are from some unnamed invertebrate, sometimes identified to the level of family or genus, but not to the level of species. So there are many sequences in GenBank from unnamed parasites. What are they? Well, we're not really sure. For example, in Opistorchis, this one is misnamed, Opistorchis lobatus. This is misnamed, this one is misnamed, this one is misnamed, and this one is misnamed. I know that because I've been doing some research on these. So these four names are not really valid. They're not correct. These are guesses. They are not well argued names. And then here, these are only identified to the level of genus. We don't know what species they are, just identified to the level of genus. So that is another problem with using DNA sequences in the study of parasites. So at the level of species and genus, DNA sequences can be useful, but interpretation of them can be difficult. DNA sequences have been much more useful for us at the higher levels, 
looking at the big divisions of life at the level of phylum, order phylum, and so forth. So DNA sequences are very good for identifying the major groups of life. Here, the major groups of animals. Here, the major groups of trematodes. I showed you this slide earlier. Here, the major groups of tapeworms. The classification that we have got from those conserved DNA sequences are actually very useful and very good. And it's interesting looking at tapeworms. These are all the different order level groups of tapeworms. Each of these is a different order. And only members of two orders infect humans. The Diphylobothriidae and the Cyclophilidae. Cyclophilidae include Tinea and Echinococcus, and the Diphylobothridia include Diphylobothrium and some of the relatives. Almost all the rest of this huge range of tapeworms infect fish, and most of them infect sharks. Similarly with nematodes. Classification of nematodes at the level of order or higher level clades has been impossible in the past. We could not do it until the last 10 years. Now we have a classification system at the high level, way up here, that actually works. It makes biological and it makes morphological sense. So DNA sequences have been very good for working with parasites at those levels. Okay, our time has nearly finished. Um, there are just a few, just the last couple of slides. These are revision notes. These go back through the topics that I've covered during the lecture. Definitions of taxonomy, classification, and systematics. Definition of a phylogeny. What is a phylogenetic tree? What is a species? How might you define a species? How do new species evolve from old ones? Allopatric and sympatric speciation. Sympatric speciation in parasites is associated with host switching. Then I talked about phylogenetic terminology, monophyly, paraphyly, and the Linnaean classification system, and the rules about naming species, the rules of zoological nomenclature, the rules of naming. How many species are there? Morphology versus molecules, and the problem of hidden species, cryptic species, and the value of sequence data for determining higher level phylogenetic relationships. So that's a summary of the topics that I've covered. There is a list here that we could use. I'm not going to go through those questions now, but you might want to consider them next week. And I will soon send you some more information about the lecture and discussion section uh, session next week. Okay, I have reached the end.